That is a good word right there, I'll guarantee you. And you get a chance to prove that a lot, don't you? No matter what happens. You make a statement like that and I'll guarantee you that the old hurt whisperer is going to be going to be challenged by that, but that is a statement of faith to the Lord. I am going to praise the Lord no matter what happens. I'm going to keep my focus on Him, my attention on Him, and I'm going to see God the way God is, and I'm going to be encouraged by the presence of the Lord. That's what that's really all about. Because, you know, discouragement is really one of those inevitable things that happen to us as human beings. Uh, if the, the word inevitable, inevitable is be def, being defined as something that will, uh, that will happen. And so I submit to you that with that definition, there's nothing more inevitable in life, well, except maybe death and taxes <laughs> and discouragement in life. You know, the mortality rate, by the way, is hovering right around 100%. I don't know if y'all checked it lately, but yeah, we, we don't get out of here, uh, you know, in this, in this body that we're in, you know. But, uh, but we all get discouraged, and discouragement is something that we all have to deal with in our life. And the devil loves to discourage us because, well, let me, let me put this up here because I have a little track, I mean a little, a little slide that gives a couple of definitions for discouragement. Look at that second one, to deprive of courage. Uh, that, that's what the devil loves to do in our life is to uh, discourage us because it takes away our courage. And it changes the way we look at life, and it changes the way we approach life. And it gets us reacting rather than obeying the Lord. Um, it, gets us, it gets us off of the balls of our feet, so to speak, in faith and back on, back on our heels in faith. And the Lord doesn't intend for us to live life back on our heels. He intends us to live life uh, on the balls of our feet, ready to obey and move with him. Now, there's a story in the Bible, and I know many people love the life of David, right? You love King David. Uh, much of the book of 1 Samuel is about King David. Just about half of the book of 1 Samuel is about King David. Starts with him being, uh, being anointed as a boy, and then Goliath, and then serving Saul, and then in the palace, and then Saul trying to kill him, and then running for his life. Then he gets married. Then he gets, finally becomes king. Well, in, in the book of 1 Samuel, there's, there are many stories about King David's life that are tremendously encouraging and and, and give you a great outlook on what David really thought about life and how he viewed life and, 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 and what he, uh, how, he, how he trained himself to, to uh, see the Lord in everything in life. And, and in one of, the, one of the events, and I'm going to just tell you this event rather than trying to read it because it covers about five or six chapters. But let me just say this, that at one point in David's life, David is... Uh, He's killed Goliath. When he kills Goliath, he gets taken into the palace of Saul. You guys remember this, because Saul has this problem, and he has these fits of rage and, and all of those kind of things. And so David gets brought into the palace to play his harp and comfort him when he goes into these fits and so forth. And David does that. And then something begins to happen that uh, really disturbs Saul. The women of Israel begin to sing a song that really bothers Saul. And the, the lyrics of the song were something like this. Uh, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is slain his tens of thousands. And in, a, in, a, in literally a fit of jealousy and rage, uh, Saul tries to kill David. I mean, he, while, while David's playing the harp, trying to comfort him and, and soothe him in the palace, Saul's slinging javelins at David. And uh, David's dodging the javelin, uh, javelins, and, and he, he keeps on playing. Well, eventually it comes to the point where he has to leave the palace for his own life because Saul now is trying to kill him. Well, you all know that David has already been anointed king of Israel, right, when he was a boy. I mean, from a little boy, David was anointed. He was going to be the future king of Israel. But right now, he's in the palace, and he's serving, and Saul's trying to kill him, and he gets out, and he begins to uh, run from Saul, run for his life, and over a period of quite a few chapters, uh, there are many times that David could have killed Saul. He had Saul in the crosshairs, you know, had a, you know, had him, I mean, cut off a piece of his robe. He got so close to him, you know, and, and gave it to him to prove, hey, man, I, I, you know, let's, let's calm this down, man, you know, because I don't want to, I don't want to put my hands on God's anointed is what David really thought. And so David, one night, <clears throat> David marries Saul's daughter, uh, who, by the, her, whose name is Michael, and they're living in, in, a, in, in their own home. And one night, that home gets surrounded by all of Saul's assassins, all of Saul's soldiers are surround the house. And they, they look out and they see that the soldiers have surrounded the house. 
And then they, they come up with a plan and Michael participates in the plan to hide him and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, it was that, on that night where, where David looks out the window and sees all of Saul's trained assassins, his soldiers surrounding the house uh, with, the, with the full intent of, uh, of killing him that night that David uh, goes in and David does what David does many, many times when he is in trouble. When his life is in trouble, what does David do? David writes a psalm. <laughs> David, David, David gets, on, uh, gets before God and he just gets, he, he just, and, 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 and what I'm saying is if there was any time in David's life that he had to be discouraged, I mean, he had to feel defeated in life. He, all he had tried to do is serve Saul and serve the kingdom and love God and, 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 and be a man of God and be what God had called him to be. I mean, he, he obeyed his parents. He, he lived right. He tried to do the right thing. If there was any time in his life that he would have certainly been discouraged, it would have been right now when he looks out those windows and he begins to see Saul's men all around him ready to kill him. And, and, and at that point... David does something. David does several things, as a matter of fact, and I've just chosen three of them as keys to uh, defeating discouragement in your life. If David, you know, David w was more discouraged than at any other time in his life, certainly this would have been that time. And so David does three things that I think will take us and help us when we face discouragement. Number one, I'd call it a Godward mindset. In other words, focusing your mind toward God. 73 of the, there are 150 Psalms that are in the book of Psalms, and 73 of them are attributed to David. David was a worshiper, and, and uh, you know that, the, that God called David a man after his own heart. And of course, you know that doesn't mean that David was sinless because uh, the Bible's filled with David's sins. David was a David was uh, an anomaly in many ways. When, 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 when his life was in trouble, he, he had the best attitude in the world. I mean, he went to the Lord, he wrote Psalms, and he worshiped God, and he did. And then when his life got in good times, uh, uh, that's when his attitude was the worst, and he let his life kind of get slippy with Bathsheba and Uriah and the census and all, all kind of different things. So David was, David, David at, 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 at times whenever things got really rough, David, the first thing David went to was the Lord and, and put his mind toward God and his face toward God. Now, Pastor Tanya put up on the screen a moment ago, and I'm just going to use the same scripture because it's just a, it's just a good example of, what, of how David felt about the Lord in his life. And look at what he says. He says, I have set the Lord always before me. So David said, in every circumstance of life, there's one thing that I know, and I know that the Lord is there. So I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. So this, guys, is a, is a Godward mindset. What the devil wants from us is to have a godless mindset, a godless mindset, which just simply means instead of seeing God, I see the mountains or I see the, I, I see the problems, I see the troubles, I see the giants in the land, the lions, the tigers, and the bears, uh, uh, just so you don't see God. That's what the devil wants. And so David chose to see God in everything in life. And I'm just saying to us that, that choosing to see God in every area of life is a choice that we make and that we choose to see God in all of the circumstances of our life. And uh, David saw God in everything, like uh, when he fought Goliath. You remember this? David is a young boy, and he's, uh, he comes down to, his father sends him down and says, hey, go down and check on your brothers and take this cheese and you know, uh, give them a few snacks and see how it's going up at the war front. And David goes down there. He's just a little bitty guy. And when he gets there, his brothers, you know, they're mad because he's there. Who left, who'd you leave those little sheep with? And I mean, they insult him and everything. But he doesn't let that bother him. He's just standing there. And while he's standing there, there's this giant that comes out in the valley down there, and he begins to insult the people of Israel. And he begins to insult God. And, all, and I'm sure David is standing there looking around going, man, I'm telling you, I, uh, I, I, I want, uh, somebody's going to jump up and take the challenge of this guy. you know." But all of the trained soldiers of Israel, the, all the, the, the trained fighting men of Israel, the big guys uh, were all shaking in their boots while Goliath taunted 
the children of Israel. And David said, wait a minute here. What in the world is going on? And David goes over and David says, uh, hey, I'll take the challenge. And, 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 the, and Goliath says, well, come on down. And, and as David makes his way down the mountain and he begins to see the sword and the spear that Goliath has in his hand, David says, here's what David said. David said, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the living God. So David saw God in everything. Goliath was not an enemy. Goliath was someone who God could conquer. And, and David said, you, you know, uh, I choose to see God. And, 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 and we all have an opportunity to keep our mind toward God. Because if you're a child of God, the Bible says he, that God says to us that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. So as a child of God, God is always there whether we acknowledge that or not. But whether we acknowledge that or not controls our state of mind and our attitude. And if we see God in all the circumstances of our life, then God becomes a partner in everything that needs to happen in our life. And if we don't see God in these circumstances of our life, these circumstances can become overwhelming in life. Psalm 59 is a psalm that was written by David while he was sitting in his house surrounded by the enemies, by Saul's soldiers. And um, I'd like for you to, I don't know if you've ever read the book of Psalms uh, uh, 59, but I want you to see this. And I want you to see one thing that we probably, very few people look at when they begin to read any of the Psalms. If you, in your Bible, if you have in your Bible at the top of, at the heading of, of Psalms, right under whatever Psalm it is, Psalm 59, Psalm 46, Psalm 21, whatever it might be, if there are any instructions that the writer of the Psalm has given to the musician that's going to be playing the Psalm, or any other kind of instructions that he wants to write about the psalm, there's a little title up there that includes some words that the writer of that psalm wants people to know about the psalm when they read it. And, and this, is, this is what David, David wrote Psalm 59, and this is what David wrote above Psalm 59 so that everybody would understand what this psalm is talking about. Notice what he says, to the chief musician... Set to do not destroy. Now, I don't know what do not destroy. It must be a tune or something. He says, all right, this, song, this psalm's to be sung to the tune of do not destroy, whatever that may be. A victim of David. That word victim is almost uh, untranslatable. The translators think it has something to do with atonement. So David's, this psalm is something about atonement. Uh, a victim of David. Notice, though, when he wrote it, when Saul sent men and they watched the house in order to kill him. So David is saying this psalm was written when I was in my house looking out my window and I saw all of Saul's soldiers around my house and I knew that he had sent them to kill me. And here's what came out of my heart. Deliver me from mine enemies, O God. Defend me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloodthirsty men. For look, they lie in wait for my life. The mighty gather against me. Not for my transgressions, nor for my sin, O Lord. They, prepare, they run and prepare themselves uh, through no fault of mine. Awake to help me and behold. Now we're going to skip down to verse 8. But you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You shall have all the nations in derision. I will wait for you, O you, my strength, for God is my defense. My God of mercy shall come to meet me. God shall let me see my desire, O mine enemies. So David says, when Saul was around my house and I knew that they were going to kill me, uh, he, he, here's, here's where my heart went. And, and he wrote Psalm 59. So I want you to get the picture. David is part of the government. You know, when he gets taken into the palace, he becomes part of the government. And, uh, and he's part of the government. And he's, and, he's, and he's in Saul's palace and he's privy to a lot of information and a lot of, and then the women start singing and Saul gets jealous and fits of rage and he starts trying to kill David and then David has to detach from the government and he has to, he has to flee for his life even though he was a, anointed to be, to be king. This would make a great movie, wouldn't it? I mean, really. 
It'd be a good, a good spy thriller, right? How many of you like spy thrillers? Oh, yeah. uh, you like Mission Impossible, the Born Identity stuff? You like yeah, all that yeah. kind of stuff? Well, I mean, think about it. Think about what kind of movie this would make. Here you have uh, a person that's part of the government, and they're up at the high levels, and they have the inside knowledge and information, and then all of a sudden something happens there, and everybody kind of turns on them, and then, uh, and then they've got to get out of the government, but they still have a lot of information that they know about that they're not supposed to know about, and so the government says, well, we can't have them walking around with all that information, so, we, so the president gets his trained assassins and his inside men, and he says, all right, you got to get out there, and you got to get that guy. You can't let him you know, you can't let him get away because he's going to spoil everything for us. And then they begin to, uh, to pursue him in every, around every bend and every cave, wherever they go. And then finally, they find out where he lives and that he's at home. And so they go that night and they surround his house, you know, and they're going to, and, and I mean, this is one of the, you know, we could make it with all kinds of special effects and all that kind of stuff and the latest gadgets and, and they got all of that. And then the music begins to play in the background, and, uh, and, uh, that, that kind of, that kind of dastardly type music and, and the cameras begin to scan out and we see a big screen and around that, you know, it, it, there, there they are gathered around Saul's house. I mean, around David's house and they're just beginning to inch in and inch in and inch in and, and, and and, 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 and we know something's about to happen. And then the camera comes in close and it kind of zooms in through the window. And when it zooms in through the window, we see, um, uh, the, the, we see the, the, the man they're looking for is kneeling on, on his living room floor. And then as the camera zooms in more and we can kind of hear, he seems to be talking about something and saying something. And as the camera zooms in, what we hear is we hear him Praising and glorifying and worshiping God. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Now, have you ever seen that movie? No, <laughs> no and neither have I, because that movie doesn't exist, right? But that is the exact movie of what Psalm 59 was written about in the life of King David. The king is trying to kill David, and his trained soldiers are surrounding his house, and David is crying out to God and saying, Oh, God, I hadn't done anything wrong. I don't know why they're here. God, these are bloodthirsty men. Save me. You know, my God of mercy, come down and save me and rescue me from this situation. So in, in the worst of circumstances, David's mindset is, God is my defense and God is my protector. And he's thinking and talking about, about God. Now, David would not allow the devil to take away the thought of the presence of God from his life. David said, I have set the Lord always before me. Whatever happens in my life, I, I know that God is there and I know that God is with me and I've said him always before and, 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 and he's bigger than my giants, he's bigger than my mountains, he's bigger than my problems, he's bigger than the enemies and, and the worst thing that could ever happen to me is if I forget where God is and, and, and if I forget that God is my, is, is my protector and my hero, it is, it's game, set, and match for the enemy because if I get my heart off of God, the enemy can overwhelm me so easily because it's such a drastic uh, issue in our life. Now, if you'll put your mind on the Lord and put him ahead in every circumstance, yeah. there are four things that'll happen. Those of you that have the outline already have them written down, but let me give them to you just real quick. There are four, these are the four things that happen when you put your mind on the Lord and you do not allow the enemy to take your thoughts and your heart away from God, no matter what the circumstance may be. Here's what happens. Number A, you receive instant encouragement and a new perspective. In other words, you see a big God and a little devil. What the devil would love for you to see when you get discouraged is to see a big devil and a little God. He wants you to see all your problems. He wants you to see the mountains in your life. He wants to see the troubles in your life. He wants you to see everything that's going wrong in your life and to see a big problem and a little God. If we put God as the head of our heart and the head of our thought and we worship and praise him and we have a Godward mindset, what that just simply means is that we're going to be able to see a big God and a little devil. And in all circumstances, God gets bigger. As God gets bigger, my problems get smaller. Number two. It feeds your faith and starves your worries and fears. When I get my heart on God, 
my faith gets stronger and my fears and my worries get weaker. Because when my mind is on God, I, am, I become more sensitive to God. I become more aware of the presence of God. I begin to see and sense God around me. And as I see and sense God around me, it encourages my faith to believe and it begins to starve my fears and worries. If I don't have my mind on God, if I have my mind on the circumstances, the mountains, the giants, the, the problems, the issues in life, what happens is, then is I begin to feed my fear and worries and starve my faith. The third thing that happens, it changes the way you talk. All of us speak according to our perspective, right? The things that come out of our mouth are the things that we believe, see, feel. Uh, it's, it's our perspective that's doing the talking when we talk, right? I don't know how many of you are old enough to have been around in 1969, but in 1969, there was a show that came out and, uh, on TV, and my family loved it. Uh, not only my family, but I think a lot of other families evidently loved it. It was a, it was a show called Hee Haw. How many of you remember Hee Haw? <laughs> Hee Haw, yeah. One of my, one of my favorite uh, uh, skits on that, on, on, on that program, and you can go on YouTube, by the way, if you, if you like to look at some old history stuff, you can go on there and see all this. But the, one, of the, one of the skits I loved was when the, the quartet of guys were singing up there, standing up there, and, and here's what they were singing. They were singing, gloom, despair, and agony on me. You remember that? Yeah, yeah. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. <laughs> you can tell I've seen it a few times. If it, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, there are people that sing that song every day. That's the way their life, that, that's the perspective of their life. And I'm talking about even Christian people. And I'm not saying they don't love the Lord. I'm not saying they aren't going to heaven when they die and all of that. I'm just saying that, they, that, that the devil is so slick in what he does. He's so successful at removing God's presence from, from our thinking that the confession of many people become gloom, despair, and agony on me. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made, is what God's Word said. I will what? Rejoice and be glad in it. So no matter what day it is, I can rejoice and be glad. Why? Because God is with me, and he's bigger than my problems, and he's bigger than my fears, and he's bigger than my mountains, and he's bigger than my struggles. And even though I have problems, it's going to be a good day because God is with me. So when I had turned my heart toward God... Uh, it changes the way I talk. And then the last thing, it causes you to be an encourager of other people. Did you know that David was the most inspirational king that Israel ever had? David just inspired men to follow him. When David was running for his life from Saul, many times there were 600 men with him, going everywhere with him, defending him, protecting him. He, he just inspired uh, courage everywhere he went. And, and, and in chapter 19, you know, his, his, first Samuel 19, his house gets surrounded. And then by chapter 20, 27, he's, he has to go and live with the Philistines. And this is just an amazing thing. You remember Goliath was a Philistine, right? Yeah, yeah. And the Philistines were arch enemies of Israel, right? Do you know that David went to, went to the Philistines and said, hey, Saul's trying to kill me. Can I hide out with you guys? And the Philistines said, yeah, come on in, man. Yeah. I thought, man, when you, can, when you can inspire the enemy, you, you, you really, you got some encouragement going on in your life. And then in chapter 28, uh, the Philistines kick him out because they're afraid that, uh, they don't know his motives and they're afraid, okay, we might not get it in battle and he's going to turn on us. So we need to ask him to leave. David said, okay, I'm leaving. And he went to, the town, he went to his hometown of Ziklag. How would you like to be from Ziklag? Z-I-G-L-A-K, -Z Ziklak. Mm, sounds like an inspirational place, right? Ziklak, when he got back to Ziklak, though, here's what he found. The town was burned down. What? Yeah, the whole town was burned down. And all the women and children had been taken captured, captive by those rascally Amalekites. They had, come in, they had come in and taken all the women and children to be slaves. 
and had burned the town down to the ground. And David's standing there on the ashes of his town and finds out that all the women and, and children, and then he says, well, we're going to go get them back. And they did. And they, he tore the Amalekites up and got them all back and brought them back in. That was in chapter 20, 28 and 29. And then in chapter 2 of 2 Samuel, which is only three chapters later, David becomes the king of Israel. So literally, right before David becomes the king of Israel, at the very worst moment of his life, in the worst circumstances of his life, he sits down and pens Psalm 59 about encouraging others that the Lord will never leave them and the Lord would never forsake them. And the, le the devil loves to discourage us because the devil wants to use our mouths as microphones yeah. of discouragement. I mean, not only does he want to discourage you, he wants to spread the joy. He wants you to become a discourager of other people and, 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 and just spread that discouragement around. One of my favorite lines of, of Scripture, and I haven't said it in a long time, and Tan, you'll remember, is um, the line, garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. This comes out of Isaiah 61, by the way. And it, it doesn't just say that. It says, I'm going to give you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for your mourning, your sadness, and then I'm going to give you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So the instruction basically is, it's a garment. Whenever you get discouraged, you put this garment on. And this garment is a garment of praise. And, and you're going to have to put it on because this gar you're not born with it. Uh, you don't wake up with it every day. Um, uh, you have to make a choice when you get up. I'm going to put on the garment of praise. I'm going to praise God today. Uh, and, 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 and that's what the devil is, is fearful of, is that we would have our mind and our heart on God no matter what, because when you begin to praise God in your circumstances, darkness has to flee, the enemy has to flee, God shows up, and God takes over the situation, and your life is blessed. So a Godward praise is, uh, is, is a, a weapon against discouragement in life. Let me give you a second weapon that David has. Uh, realistic expectations. I know this may sound a little bit weird, but when David was anointed king of Israel, have you ever thought about that, by the way? Have you ever thought about what you would do if you had been anointed king of Israel when you were a boy? I mean, you're called in out of the sheep field, and, uh, and Samuel, the prophet, puts oil on you, pours oil on you, and says, all right, you're, you're the future king of Israel. What you would have thought, how you would have thought things would have gone I mean, how would you imagine things going if that was you? Well, you know, that night you, you, you're laying down out in the field with the, with the other, you know, because dad sent you back out there to, you know, you may be the king, but you're going to go take care of those sheep. And he's out there sleeping. And could you imagine uh, what he's imagining in life? Like, well, I wonder what's going to happen next. Well, well, let me just say this. First of all, uh, I'm glad they finally got the right one. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm glad they finally realized you know, who I was because he wasn't their first choice. They went through all the seven other brothers. He was the eighth. He was the baby boy. He was so singularly unimpressive that dad didn't even bring him in. But Samuel said, don't you have anybody else? He said, well, I got the little old boy out there keeping the sheep, David. And he said, well, go get him. And, and it was David. And David, you know, he, now he's the king and he's sitting out in the field and I'm thinking, well, what, 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 what does he imagine happen? Well, it might be that, you know, tomorrow a big black limousine from Jerusalem is going to show up and they're going to get me in there and they're going to drive me to Jerusalem. And when I get to Jerusalem, boy, they're going to have a big ceremony, a big coronation ceremony. And they're going to have lots of food and banquet and party. They'll have a band playing and it's going to be a, just a tremendous coronation of king. And then I'm going to be king and everybody's going to, uh, you know, honor Honor me as king and, and celebrate me as king because I'm the king of Israel. Now, if David had thought that, he would have gotten his heart broken because that is so far from what happened once he became anointed to be king of Israel that it's not even funny. When Samuel the prophet came in and anointed David to be king of Israel, it started problems, and there was problem after problem after problem. Rather than going uh, to Israel, uh, to Jerusalem in a black limo, uh, he had to go back out there to the field, and he had to take care of his father's sheep. He didn't even get relieved from that. 
And then he had to go to a battlefield and he had to fight a giant on that battlefield in order to defend Israel's honor. And then he went to Saul's palace and he just started playing and he was such a talented musician and such a wonderful nature and a wonderful personality. He was kind to everybody and pleasant and doing his job. And then all of a sudden, Saul starts throwing javelins at him, trying to pin him against the wall and kill him. Then he has to get out and run for his life. And as he's running for his life, Saul's constantly trying to kill him and sending hired assassins to murder him and, and find him and all of that. And then he has to go to the enemy camp to Philistines. The enemy, y'all. He had to go to the enemy's camp and say, guys, hey, can you hide me from Saul? He's, I don't know, he's kind of going crazy. He's trying to kill me out here or something like that. And, the, and, and they do. And then he finally leaves there and he goes to his hometown and, the, and his hometown is burned down to the ground. And his wife and children have been taken as slaves. And his own men are thinking about stoning him to death. I mean, that's how bad it had gotten. So we're talking about realistic expectations. One of the weapons we have against discouragement is realistic expectations. What kind of expectation? Here, here's what David knew. There's going to be a fight, and then I'm going to win. There's going to be a fight, and then I'm going to win. Now, this is the way we have to think. We have to think, in this life that we're in, there's going to be a fight, and then we're going to, we're going to, we're going to win. I will guarantee you that if you will think like this, you will never become discouraged, and you will never become overwhelmed. There's going to be a fight, and then I'm going to win. Now, if you don't think that way, you're going to get your heart broken because there's going to be a fight. <laughs> if you don't expect a fight, you have unrealistic expectations, is what I'm trying to say to you. If you don't think that the Christian life is a fight from daylight to dark and during the night, you don't have realistic expectations. If you think you come into a life of Christ and it's all honey and no bees, uh, 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 no work and all ease, uh, you're going you, you, to be heartbroken in life because there's going to be a fight. Look, look, look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, these things have, I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Everybody say, that in me. Yes. All right, so the peace is in him. You don't have him, you don't have peace, right? right. I, these things I've spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. What was Jesus saying? Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. This world is filled with tribulation, but don't let that discourage you because I have overcome the world. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, there's going to be a fight, and then you're going to win. The apostle Paul said in the book of Romans, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. What is the apostle Paul saying? He's saying there are going to be problems in life, but God's going to do some great things when you have problems in life. So there's going to be a fight in life, but don't worry, then you're going to win. King David, I mean, we've been reading everything about him. King David didn't just get discouraged and overwhelmed in the fight because it was fight after fight after fight after fight after fight. Rather than being anointed king of Israel and being whisked away by the black limo and shows up in Jerusalem and all these good things happen, David is anointed king of Israel and literally all hell breaks loose in his life. If I were David, I would have probably wanted to have a little conversation with God and said, God, you know, uh, what's the deal here? What, 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 I, I thought I was anointed king of Israel. What, what, what in the world's going on? Yeah. Or, or at least I would like to ask God, hey, God, before you, you know, uh, send me a letter. Um, before you send Samuel down there, send me a letter and, and give me all the uh, instructions about what's going, what, what that means when, he, when I stand there and allow him to pour that oil on me. I mean, come on, God, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the perspective of the chronically discouraged is this. I expect victory without difficulty. Like, there's not going to be a fight, but I'm still going to win. That's unrealistic expectations. 
Let me just give you one more about Peter. I love this, what Peter says. Beloved, look, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you, might all, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Now, Peter's trying to encourage us here, right? He's trying to give some comfort to believers. And he basically is asking, are you going through trouble? Uh, are you having problems in your life right now? Well, join the club. <laughs> and don't get overwhelmed with what's happening to you because it, it, it happens to everybody. Nothing that's happening to you is not common to all of us as believers in Christ. So you're in a common fight and, 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 and then you're going to win. Because the devil always fights us for our promised land. Do you know that the, most, the, 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 that the, the age group that experiences more divorces in this country than any other age group, it is the age group between 20 and 25 years old. And it is because they get married with such unrealistic expectations. They get married with no expectation of there's going to be a fight. In every marriage, listen, listen, in your marriage, in your finances, in your children, in your job, in your income, in your neighborhood, in your housing, and in, in every part of your life, there's going to be a fight. The enemy's going to move in with problems and troubles and issues, and you're going to have to make concessions, and you're going to have to have peace conferences, and you're going to have to talk about things, and you're going to have to work together. You're going to have to give a little and get a little, and, you're going to have, and it's going to be a constant battle and fight. But, but, but in all of those areas of life, the Lord says, there's going to be a fight, and then you're going to win. Now, if you're on your way to hell, the devil's going to leave you alone. Because he doesn't want to break the flow. You already headed in the right direction as far as he's concerned. So there's no reason to bother you at all. But listen, once you decide you're on your way to hell and you want, and then you decide, you know, I don't want to go to hell. I'm going to turn around. And you make that decision to turn around and start walking toward Christ to live for Christ. There's going to be a fight. You know why? Because you're walking to your promised land. Your promised land is not back there. Your promised land is right over there. And when you're on your way to your promised land, the enemy is going to put giant after giant after giant after giant, battle after battle after battle to keep you from inheriting your promised land. And if you don't see giants when you're moving that way, you're not headed to your promised land. You're not fighting the real battle in life. So, all right, number one key is a Godward mind. Uh, I, I think God, God is in every circumstance in my life. Realistic expectations, there's going to be a fight, and then I'm going to win. And then here's the third key, faith in God's grace. And I'm going to do this quickly. Uh, I think you got the gist of what's going on, right? Faith in God's grace would be this. What was it that qualified David to become king of Israel? The answer is nothing. He didn't have any qualifications to become king of Israel, right? I mean, he was too young for the first place. He's a boy, too young to become king, too little, not sophisticated enough, not enough experience in life. I mean, David didn't know anything about the government. David didn't have any idea about finances and, 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 and uh, government living and, and all of the things that it might take to be the king of Israel. He was a boy. The only thing that qualified David to be king of Israel was that God chose him. And so what I'm saying to you is that in life, it is God's grace alone that qualifies us to be loved by God, protected by God, used by God, honored by God, and blessed by God. It is only the grace of God that gives us that opportunity. It's not our performance. It's not what we do. Grace is all about God. Performance is all about us. Performance is 
how well you do, how long you do, how good you do it, and how good at it you are. But our lives are not blessed according to the word of God by how well we do and how long we do and how, and how prosperous we are in life. Our life is blessed because we have a God of grace that sits in heaven and offers us, offers, offers us what we don't deserve in life and keeps us from getting what we do deserve in life. When I entered the ministry, I was totally unprepared to live a life of grace. I was totally about performance. I mean, I, I, I had just come, I mean, I got saved when I was in high school. I didn't come out of a Christian family. Nobody in my family was a Christian. I didn't know anything about church, Christian life, or anything. I got invited to a church by a guy that I'm not sure is saved yet today. But he invited me to church, and the Lord began to work on my life. And, 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 and several years later, I came to the Lord. I was in high school. And then the Lord called me to the ministry and felt, I felt like, okay, God, you have a special calling on my life and you have something you want me to do. And you know the story. I reached in, the, I saw the trash can. I said, just reach in your trash can and anything nobody else wants to do, just give it to me. And sadly, he's done, you know, he, he's done that a lot. Um, no reflection now. I'm not trying to downgrade you. But I'm just saying that I've, that, that, that when I entered the ministry, I thought the ministry was all about performance. I mean, why wouldn't I think that? Everything else in life's that. If you do good, you get good, right? If you do bad, then you, you, know, you get some bad in life. I'm sure that I have burned out several times in the ministry in my 45 years because I live so much of it trying to perform and do everything right and, and be successful and be a good pastor. You know what I do? It was like pedaling on a bike. It, it, I, I'm, I'm pedaling and, and I'm pedaling hard. I, I want to be a good pastor. I want to be a good counselor. I want to be a good listener. I want to be a good preacher. I want to be a good husband. You know, I want to be, I mean, and I'm just pedaling, 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 and I'm pedaling. And, and, and here was my philosophy. The more discouraging things got, just pedal faster, pedal harder. You know, work better, make it better. Until one night in my office, I was sitting there studying the word and I believe, I believe God spoke to me and however you, you know, want to hear it in your heart and, or however it might be, it wasn't an audible voice, but I heard God say, basically I said to God, God, I can't pedal anymore. I can't do this anymore. I'm tired, I'm wore out, I can't do it. I, I, and I'm not going to do it, that's what I said. Can you imagine that? I thought, I, I, I kind of tried to imagine the scenario of what God was going to say to me. I imagined him looking at me and says, does the term crispy critters mean anything to you? <laughs> you know, no, I fully expected God to basically say back to me, you better get back on that bicycle and you better get to pedaling and don't you get off. But I was shocked by what he did say to me. He said, that's good, Keith. Stop pedaling. Stop, get off the bike. Because it's never been about your performance. It's never been about how much you do and how good you do it. It's all about, it's all about me, so you can just stop pedaling right now and you can just rest in my grace. That's what I want you to do. It's all about my grace. And you don't have to keep pedaling, and all you have to do is obey. That's all you have to do. It's not about performance. It's about obedience. Performance is about me. Obedience is about him. Performance is about me, and grace is about him. And, 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 and I say to you that I am standing here this morning simply as as, as an absolute example of the grace and the mercy of God. In Psalm 59, the men of Saul surrounded David's house and in the midst of it, David looked at him and said, my God of mercy shall come and pull me out of this, fi out of this fire. My God of mercy will meet me. What does my God of mercy mean? If, God is, if he's calling on a God of mercy, you know what mercy is, right? Mercy keeps you from getting what you deserve. 
And David said, my God of mercy shall come to me saying, I don't deserve it, God. I didn't earn it. I don't, uh, uh, there's no reason you should come. Uh, I'm not worthy of your coming, but you are a God of mercy and God of mercy, come and rescue me. And that's the reason God comes. He's the God of mercy and a God of grace. It's not because you're the best and you're the greatest and you do everything right. Listen, this is one thing you can count on. Anytime your life is falling apart, now listen to me when I say this. Anytime your life is falling apart and everything in your life is coming down, you can always count on the devil showing up and making it all about you. The hurt whisperer, when you're hurting, when you're confused, when you're in pain, the hurt whisperer comes to you and begins to whisper to you things that make what is happening be all about you. You're not good enough. I told you God didn't love you. You must miss God. <laughs> that faith, where's that faith now? Do you realize how goofy you look, how weird you are? You're a disappointment in life. You'll never make it. You're so far from God, God would never want you. You know how you defeat the devil? Book of Revelation tells us. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. How are you going to defeat the devil? You're going to get a 38 and pop him with it? Uh, you're going to get you a, a big buoy knife and, and cut him up. Uh, get a stick, hit him. I mean, what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to the devil? How are you going to fight the devil? And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. The word of the testimony is basically, I, I, I don't qualify. I, I, I don't deserve it. <laughs> There's no reason God should love me, but God loves me anyway. And I receive the love of God. I mean, that's the word of your testimony. The word of your testimony is God's great. And, and, and he gives us things gracefully and fully. And we don't deserve them. And God gives them because God is a God of mercy. And sure, I've done things that are wrong. And you have too. Bunches of things that are wrong. I know I've made some financial mistakes. But my God of mercy shall come. I know I've made some mistakes in marriage, but my God of mercy shall come. I know I've made some mistakes in raising my family, but my God of mercy shall come. And if I've committed a thousand sins, one drop of his precious blood eliminates all of them. That is the grace and the mercy of God. And when the devil comes to you and says, you're not good enough, you're not worthy, you're not smart enough, you're not, you don't have enough money, you're not the right kind of person, you don't have the right social standing, it is the blood of Christ and the word of your testimony that defeats the, en the enemy. My God of mercy shall come. And David was rescued because in this natural world, David was done for, right? Right? Game, set, and match. You're not going to escape it. He had lost everything. His family, his kids, his home. You know, everything in life. But literally, two chapters later, he becomes king of Israel. I mean, this was simply the darkness before the dawn. You've heard that old proverb, that old phrase, it's always darkest before dawn, right? This was literally darkness before dawn. And I'm just saying that for us, you know, we may have had some setbacks in life. We may have had some overwhelming circumstances. Maybe in our family, maybe in our life, maybe in our, in our finances. It might be in our job. It might be with our business. It might even be something to do with church. You might, have, you might have gotten discouraged about church or disappointed in something about church. But let me say this to you, and I want you to believe this, and I promise you, then we're going to bow our head. Believe me when I tell you, God 
is for you. Remember that. God is for you. And when that whisperer comes to you and says, you're no good, you say it is the grace of God that makes you. are right, devil. I'm not any good. You finally got something right. And I'm not any good, but God loves me anyway because he's a God of grace and mercy. So when I'm in being discouraged, keep looking toward God, see him in all my circumstances, get my expectations right, there's going to be a fight and then I'm going to win and have faith in God no matter what, the God of mercy will come and rescue my life. All right, let's bow our heads.